Welcome to the future of work. I'm so interested in this topic this week. Everybody I've mentioned that we're doing this panel to has said they know someone that's out of work, they know somebody who is working for work but has put that search on hold. If you've been following this particular series, you've heard nearly every guest we've talked to, when we ask them about the future, they say it's digital. So we wondered what that means in terms of work. That's where this panel started. But as we actually started doing the research, we noticed a few really interesting trends. Uh, first of all, Twitter, Facebook, I'm sure you've heard, have told their employees, they'll be able to work from home permanently. Uh, that's one trend. We're calling it the flexible workspace or WFH work from home. A recent survey found more than three quarters of workers said they'd actually like to continue working from home post COVID, saying that they're more productive, they get less distractions when they're at home. And any of us working at home can tell you that you love the fact that your commute is a lot shorter. Huge perk. Another thing, the Prime Minister of New Zealand suggested her country may explore a four-day work week. Uh, that points to another interesting trend we're seeing, a willingness that's uh, ready to experiment. Related to that experimentation, we know there's lots of companies that are interested in giving their employees incredible perks. You've heard about cold brew on tap, pizza Fridays. How do you then incentivize those employees when they're actually working from home? We've seen some interesting things. Hewlett Packard gave all its employees access to the meditation app Headspace. Other companies are providing telehealth services. One of my favorites is actually a startup called Snack Magic. It ships snacks directly to your employees' homes. Uh, they've shipped over 10,000 boxes since the beginning of May. The CEO of one global fashion brand told WWD recently, I believe we will never work the same way again. He said emails in his company are down 70% because people are actually connecting via Teams and this app using Zoom. But taking us back to where we started, the hardest part of all of this whole crisis so far in terms of employment is the unemployment. As of last week, July 2nd, it sits at 11.1%. That's almost 18 million people in America who are out of work right now. There is also another element to this discussion. In light of the Black Lives Matter movement, we see more companies commit themselves to diversity and inclusion initiatives. But as you'll find out today, recognizing the value of a diverse workforce and actually putting that into action are two very separate mountains to climb. So we're lucky to have a really incredible panel to help us navigate all of these sort of trends we're looking at. Karis Jones is the Director of Human Resources at Good American and Skims. A native Angelino, she holds an MBA, has started a few companies herself, including one clothing line with a Fitim alum. We'll talk to her. We also will talk to Donna Norton. She's the Senior People and Organization Partner at Curate. That's the parent company of brands that include QBC and HSN, and that's where she primarily works. She spent 30 years, though, in the HR space, working for several Fortune 500 companies, uh, also an MBA holder. My first guest, though, is Maggie Fox. Maggie is the Director of Talent Acquisition at Textile Fashion Group. They're home to several of today's top fashion brands, Savage X Fenty, Kate, uh, Kate Hudson's Fabletics, Shoe Dazzle, just a few of them. Maggie is also a Finham alum. And Maggie, as you get your camera turned on, I don't like to assume I know what people are thinking, but let me start with what I think a lot of our audience might be wondering about today. The primary question, are you hiring? And where would people go to apply if they wanted to get hired? Great question. Thank you so much, Tom, and, and to the FITM team over there for having me. I'm always happy to, to be back in any capacity, even if it's virtually speaking. Um, so yeah, to the first part of your question, Tom, yes, we are very much hiring at Textile. Uh, I believe, as is the case with a lot of other companies who have not been negatively impacted or perhaps are performing strongly despite COVID, uh, we are still taking a conservative approach on hiring given the highly unprecedented time that we're in and the uncertainty of the economy. But our business, uh, thankfully, is very strong and we will continue to hire at Textile, uh, of course, while maintaining a vigilant and, and conservative approach as we navigate this uncharted territory that we've all found ourselves in. Uh, and I'd say, you know, really for us, the highest priority in all of that is that our CEOs at Textile um, throughout this, this year and, and all that we've been confronted with has been to protect 
uh, the jobs of the employees that we currently have. And, and that's where that vigilance comes into play. Um, and, you know, look, we've been really fortunate and have had the luxury to, to perform well enough to be able to do that. And even to the extent of uh, maintaining and protecting our retail workforce throughout the stay at home mandate. Um, so, so that, that's something that we've been, you know, again, uh, very grateful, uh, and have had the luxury to do. So, um, to the latter part of your question, Tom, you know, as it relates to, uh, you know, where to apply, certainly as it relates to textile, come check out our career site, follow us on LinkedIn, but, but beyond textile, you know, to answer that question a little bit more broadly, um, I would really encourage our audience who found themselves in the job market or are contemplating making a career move to really focus on the digitally native companies. That's where you're going to see the most hiring activity. So just to, to comment on that, as of 2020 this year, eMarketer analysts estimated that mobile purchases would make up over 70% of retail commerce sales worldwide as early as 2021. So imagine the impact to that number now in a COVID world where people have grown even more accustomed to online and mobile purchases. Those, those numbers and statistics were released in January pre-COVID. So uh, you know, digitally native brands truly have consistently dominated in the market uh, in recent years and are where we've seen the most continued growth, um, even prior to COVID. But now I think in this current COVID climate that we're in, I think we will continue to see people are largely shopping from home uh, and looking to purchasing online where possible. So I would say Definitely digital Digital is the, the place to look, e-commerce brands. Um, and then just to, to illustrate that point a little bit further, because we love data at Textile. You know, we are a fashion company, but really at the heart of it, we're a tech company. So we love our data and um, data science, in fact, has been an area that has been very, uh, a, a pretty significant focus in terms of hiring. So I thought it would be worth noting to, to the group here that the job market analysis in 2019 by CompTIA found that over 300,000 new jobs were added in tech just last year and over half a million uh, tech businesses exist in the US. So while it's been said, I think time and time again, I'm sure you've heard this, Tom, I'm sure a lot of our, our viewers here today have, um, that e-commerce is the future of work and more specifically the future of, of fashion. Uh, but that future, it's now. We're in it and it's only becoming more prevalent. I think anybody listening and anybody who's followed the series will, will, will totally understand what you're saying. Tech is where the work is. It will be where the work is moving forward. But what I also question then is for someone who is not digitally native, in other words, their education happened before or the job that they had that they may have recently been laid off from, that was not a tech focused position. Are they, am I out of luck when it comes to working at a textile? Great question. It's one I get a lot. You know, we certainly see a lot of talent come to us from all different pockets of the business. Um, and I would say no, most definitely not the case. I think something to consider is the tech and e-commerce industries are fairly adolescent in relation to other industries that make up our workforce. So that means it will continue to introduce new jobs as the industry evolves uh, and really only creating more opportunity. But you know, in many cases, because this is, again, still such a budding new industry, in, you know, comparatively, relatively speaking, uh, many cases that talent pool is very small and the, the job is so new and so niche uh, and the demand is much greater than the talent that, that really exists as of yet. So as a result, companies are working to, to be really creative as to how we can solve for that. Uh, we, we tackle this every day over at Textile. Uh, and for example, I think we're gonna, going to see more companies be open to remote workforce um, and providing training internally so they can really develop that talent themselves ground up. Uh, which then means when we're doing things like that, we're not necessarily expecting that someone comes in with all of the skills, but that there's some relatable transferable skills. So you, you really have to ask yourself when you're out there in the job market and you're looking at other job opportunities, I would encourage you to, to be bold enough to, to take on some risk. Don't look to check every box. Don't look to check 100%. 
I think if you can really ask yourself, what's your existing skill set? Where may, may there be some transferable skills? And most importantly, are you eager to learn? Um, that is such a focal point. It's certainly um, one of our cornerstones is, is you know, um, learn and grow. So we talk a lot about that. And there's an expectation for all of our employees to consistently be doing that. So look, you know, Tom, to your question, certainly in the area of fashion and, and retail, we hire talent at times that just does not have that digital e-commerce experience. And in those instances, it's just critical to one's success that they come with an open mind, um, a willingness to learn uh, and, and have adaptability, which we, again, that's it's a mindset we practice. Um, the business moves quickly, the pace of it, uh, and certainly in, in the technology world, we have to be highly adaptable. So depending on where you are in your career, that may mean shedding yourself of some previously learned behaviors or strategies that just simply don't transfer or won't serve you. And instead taking a really innovative, open-minded approach and considering how alternative and new strategies may better serve the customer, the business, and, and ultimately your value as an employee and a candidate out there, out there in the market. Um, and you know, the last point I'll make is really that it's just paramount in today's workforce that you have a keen interest in learning and evolving your skills and, and to be very proactive in doing so. Um, there's just so many more resources at our fingertips than ever existed before. So I would encourage everyone to really leverage tools, resources, um, and, and to pick up those new skills and really challenge yourself to learn something and absorb some new information, uh, most notably LinkedIn Learning, which in particular has an abundance of trainings available and just simply showing your eagerness to learn, that really goes a long way. So that's, that's super interesting. This idea that the actual job function that you have previously may not be transferable, but the skill that informs that function is. is. And I hear you saying back up that skill with LinkedIn learning course or, or some other type. But in the end, will you, the HR person, see that I have done that work, that I've gone to LinkedIn learning when I'm just applying through some digital portal? It would seem this is where your network would come in, but I've always heard that the network plays a big role in the online application process. So where, where does all of that fall? You know, job application online, leveraging my network. What do I do? Yeah, yeah. So, so look, everyone should be applying online directly to any applicable jobs. Um, that, that's, that's one piece of the search. So do that. It's getting your resume that added visibility. It's getting you into the database of, you know, the companies who are hiring. So absolutely do that but it is only one data point. It is only one part of the search. So look, I still believe great talent knows great talent. Uh, you know, 30% of our hires last year were through referrals. So if you're in the job market, be proactive and reach out to your network. Don't, don't uh, undervalue uh, what, what that can help, sort of what opportunities that may unlock for you. Uh, but look, that being said, there are many challenge, uh, channels that, that we explore. And while referrals are a key source, it's important that in order to cultivate a highly innovative environment that we always aspire to at Textile, that means leveraging other resources, not solely relying on referrals. Uh, so, you know, my team does a variety of different things. We're consistently building proactive pipeline um, through extensive sourcing projects. Much of that work is done on, on LinkedIn recruiter. And, and so make sure for those of you out there who are exploring the job market, make sure that you have a presence on LinkedIn um, and that you've really maximized uh, what that can do for you. For example, Tom, you asked about LinkedIn learning and how, how can we let it be known that, that we've done that work. Uh, often when you complete courses on LinkedIn learning, it'll actually uh, give you a completion certificate that pops up on your, on your uh, account or your profile on LinkedIn. So we'll be able to see that work too. And of course you can always speak to it, but uh, you know, and then additionally, and I'd say perhaps most critically uh, right now, we're heavily focused on external organizations and partnerships. We always have been. It has been a key focus in our sourcing strategy at Textile. 
Um, but specifically, and, and certainly as of late, Textile uh, has taken a very strong stance and we're committed to the eradication of racism and creating more opportunity for people of color. Uh, and in doing so, we're really leveraging our existing partnerships and always fostering new ones. Uh, this consists of anything from HBCUs, colleges and universities with really rich diversity programs, uh, and then professional organizations such as ColorCom, NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers, BRAG, um, which is a major one in the retail uh, industry, and, uh, and Ad Color, just to name a few. And we're partnering with a, a pretty robust uh, group of, of various organizations. And it's through this holistic approach that we're able to strategically uncover really incredible best in class talent. I should also point out at this point that it's actually you who founded the diversity and inclusion initiative at Textile and you're leading that initiative over there. Yeah. Um, so certainly I, I realize and recognize the value of it. We'll dig in a, a little bit more on that, but, but last question for you for right now, it, it, look to the future. What do you see post COVID? What are the tea leaves telling you about the future of work? Sure. Well, you mentioned something actually at the start of this, Tom, I'll comment on really quickly before, before I respond more in depth, but uh, look, Wellness and well-being is such an integral part of the, the, the total rewards package now when we think about benefits, especially in this virtual world that we're all in, where I'm sure everyone's feeling that, that you know, screen fatigue that sets in when you're just on virtual call day after day. I'm used to running around from one meeting room to an next and having a lot of um, you know, in-person human connections throughout my day. Uh, so, uh, you know, Textile, you mentioned um, Headspace. Uh, Textile, for example, uh, has offered all of our employees, and this was actually something pre-COVID, but it's, it's only been uh, an added value now, but uh, has offered everyone the Calm app. So we pay for and cover Calm, which is another meditation app and, and just sort of focus on well-being and and um, just balance and, and striking that balance in this, in this environment. So anyhow, I had to mention that, but yeah. you know, when you ask about reading the tea leaves, you know, I think we're gonna see a really big culture shift. And you touched on some of this earlier, just with some of the you know, news stories that, that you noted, but I think we're gonna see that companies are going to recognize that working from home is really a viable option to explore. Um, it, it, it not only garners equal, if not greater results. I think we've been wildly productive. Um, I think we as a company have always been a little bit more on the progressive side of things and have offered a lot more flexibility uh, than I've seen from other companies. But, um, but I still think there's always room to challenge ourselves and think about what that future of work looks like. And so I think with that, we're going to see more openness to explore remote talent. Uh, we do this at Textile already for our tech workforce. Um, we have our own proprietary tech stack. So we, we have to get really creative in how we're um, sourcing and, and hiring engineers and, and you know, roles in that space. So uh, we're already doing that, but I've already seen since COVID, our leaders even begin to further evolve their way of thinking around remote talent. So for example, we recently hired a phenomenally talented VP of design for Fabletics. She's not based in Los Angeles. Uh, and it's been an entirely seamless pro uh, you know, process and transition. And I think by doing this, it really cracks open more talent for employers and creates more opportunity for talent. Um, and so it's, it's, it's gonna be a win-win. I think we're gonna see a lot more of that shift. Uh, you know, I also think we'll see an emergence of new jobs in the market that didn't exist before. You know, health screeners and advisors, more uh, fulfillment center labor needs. I know we've had an abundance uh, of hiring needs in that space specifically. Uh, reduction in brick and mortar, yes, but added roles in remote services. And again, you know, adding to the growth of e-commerce retail, further shaping the retail landscape. So. Uh, I think a lot of changes is to come. This may not actually mean the end of retail, which I think is the constant conversation people are having. I actually think it's just a new beginning. It's a time to rebuild for some. And with time, I think we're really going to see some new growth and, and with that more job opportunities to come. I love that thought. 
that's perfect. Good place to end on for, for right now. Maggie will join us again for our Q&A uh, toward the end of our hour together. Um, you can submit those questions, by the way, via the Q&A button. Um, for now, though, I'd like to turn to Donna Norton. Donna is the senior people and organization partner at Curate and supports the marketing and digital teams at both HSN and QVC. Um, which are two interesting spaces. We were talking the other day, I've, I've recently bought for the first time from QVC, but I have studied the space for some time. Um, Donna, though, I want, I want to kind of pick up where we left off with Maggie, work from home, or, or what many are now calling WFH. What are you seeing at HSN and QVC? What do you see moving forward in terms of WFH? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what Maggie said was right on, you know, we're moving into a whole new, uh, a whole new realm, a whole new world. Um, and at HSN, QVC, um, we really, you know, our team embraced this immediately and being agile and being creative, they jumped right into transitioning into this world of work. And um, it definitely, um, you know, we've seen higher productivity. We've seen people actually more engaged in terms of uh, attending meetings and People really are enjoying um, the whole interaction of being able to see each other on the screen. Um, you know, in, if people say, remember, we used to go to meetings and sit around a table and not be able to see everybody's facial expressions. Now, with the technology, um, you know, you're seeing all that. So I think that, um, you know, we, we continue to evolve, um, like Maggie was saying, with her company as well. Um, managers' mind shifts have changed. We continue to talk about what jobs make sense in terms of working from home permanently. We continue to talk about what jobs should be on site. We, we do have employees that are coming on site and have had to come on site based on our business uh, producing TV. So we've uh, certainly made uh, adapted to that environment as well and have a very safety uh, enhanced protocol around people working on site. So it's, uh, I think from the, you know, looking at the future from an HR perspective, um, we, we have to really evaluate, how, you know, how are we gonna keep people engaged? How are we gonna address that burnout, that balance, keeping people balanced? Um, and also recognizing, you know, rewards and recognition. It's, it's a whole new landscape uh, as it relates to, you know, how, how we continue to adapt. And um, so it gives us all a real boost, I think. I think it's, you know, given our, our world uh, almost a boost, a little, you know, fire under us to, uh, to be more creative and come up with great ideas and re-energize um, not only the HR world uh, and, and how, we, how we treat our employees and, and how we engage them and motivate them, but also from uh, the business side, um, you know, just uh, you know, jumping in. Um, people are working collaboratively together. Um, just uh, it, we've seen just an amazing, amazing results um, from from this change. So we'll more to come. We'll see what happens. What about the uh, application process? You're trying to get a job. What would you recommend? Yeah. Well, again, I, you know, I don't necessarily, I certainly, uh, you know, applying for jobs uh, hasn't changed, right? We, we totally have shifted to uh, online. There's no place that you can walk in anymore and apply or, you know, say, I'm interested in a job, right? It's all through, um, it's all through, you know, online. So, you know, but the key is, is number, a couple things actually I wanted to touch on is you got to get really good at at interviewing online, uh, interviewing virtually. Um, there's a couple of softwares out there, HireVue, InterviewStream, a couple of uh, softwares where you can actually go in and practice getting really good at interviewing virtually. Um, you really, one thing you, you definitely have to get good at. So that's a critical piece. And then certainly, you know, spending the time, you know, you're home, you've got focus time, get on that get on linkedin pick up the phone call friends call network uh find out what's going on um and really do your research you know staying relevant is critical and um not only relevant in terms of your profession but also relevant as it relates to the jobs that you're applying for so when you when you're looking for jobs just you know we, we always 
gave the, the advice, you know, pick out 10 companies, pick out, you know, 10, 15 companies that you're super interested in. Remember, you've got to love what you do. And especially now working from home, it's a different, right? So you really got to love what you do. I love what I do. I, you know, I don't even think about it as work um, because it's so important now that you're working from home, you, you've got to, you know, get into that groove in terms of what you're doing for the company, how you're taking care of yourself. It's, it's a whole new way. So, you know, look for companies that you're super interested in, do your research, be very well prepared, prepare yourself from an interview perspective because you are going to be interviewed virtually. You literally could go through the entire interview process virtually now and get a job offer. And also now you have a little more flexibility. You don't necessarily have to look for jobs right in your backyard. You can look for companies like the Facebooks, the Twitters that are now saying you can work from anywhere. So you can now, I can apply for a job at Facebook because now I, there you don't care where I, where I am as long as I can show value. And that's really what you wanna prepare yourself is for that interview to be able to really understand what is going on in that business and how you can bring the skills, those transferable skills, may not be in the industry that you were in before, but what value can you bring to that organization? It's, it's, it's interesting stuff. As you talk about these people who are working from home, I think about the statistic we talked about at the beginning, 77% of people want to continue working from home. Uh, so what are the best practices that you've seen to prove it's effective? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, best practices around, um, again, meetings. So being able to utilize meetings, uh, again, that's another skill that many of us weren't savvy in. You know, we didn't know how to use Teams. We didn't know how to use WebEx and Zoom. And still, there's many of us that still, I, today I was on a call uh, with, you know, somebody that was like, I still don't know how to share. So, you know, it's like, you know, so getting savvy and, and being able to really make it interactive, figure out ways in terms of a lot of um, people being creative around, you know, happy hours, at, um, getting people together for happy hours. Um, so, you know, you have to keep people engaged. You know, the high, the high degree of burnout is, is real. Screen time de definitely uh, plays havoc with, you know, your eyes. Um, sitting in a chair, they used to say, you know, before COVID, they said that sitting was the new smoking. Now, you know, it's, it really is concerning, right? Because we just sit all day in front of a screen. So, um, but I think from a best practice standpoint, some of the things that Maggie alluded to and you alluded to earlier, you know, getting, giving people uh, resources around how to, from a manager's, manager's perspective, how to engage your employees, how to have fun with your employees. Um, and then also from a employee perspective, giving them resources around how to stay well, how to, how to maintain a balance um, and, and letting people know that it's okay. You know, also the other thing that we've done um, at, at, uh, at Curate is we've offered uh, now flexible work arrangements. So there were many people that were working, you know, that eight to five and, um, or whatever, eight to six or, and now because they're home and they have their children at home and they're doing educating as well as some, some taking care of elderly parents, they need more flexibility. So they may be working uh, four day weeks so they may be working 10, 10 hour days or so we, you know, they may be working from eight to 12 and then from three to seven. So, you know, it just depends. We're, we're op being more open around, you know, and that's what's going to create that loyalty, create people, you know, again, not feeling the stress of this change, but that, wow, I can really, you know, that I have this opportunity to balance both of those things, my work, my life, you know, what's going on with COVID, um, where are we going in the future? Um, and we've also come out with a lot of other things uh, around um, source resources um, from a financial perspective to help our employees that may be their spouse or significant other has been impacted financially. So there's all kinds of things that I think companies are doing out there that um, are best practices that are helping employees stay motivated, stay engaged. And again, productivity has increased. Um, people are feeling excited and uh, energized. And uh, again, we've just got to keep that going and, um, and help them balance. 
this other kind of <laughs> this that I've seen is this idea of almost becoming your own manager. You, you don't have somebody there with you. So it's interesting to think about managers in this time who may not have the experience of managing people remotely. Um, how are you seeing that play out? Yeah. Well, you know, we, we provide a lot of coaching. We work with managers. Um, and I really feel like, uh, you know, we've, we've given them more resources. So there's tons of articles. There's, you know, all kinds of YouTube videos out there that you can watch. But it's really, you know, it really is almost, um, you know, if you, if you know, you know what is the goals are, you, you understand around setting very specific goals for everybody and holding people accountable, you know, that really hasn't changed. That's how we really should be, you know, managing performance uh, as leaders. Um, we have to just continue to do that. You know, I would say in the beginning when we went through this whole change, I'm sure this was across uh, the country, companies relaxed things a little bit. You know, they said, look, we got to make an adjustment here. We, you know, we got to figure out what's going on. You know, they gave people an opportunity to get into the groove again. And I think now we've hit that pivotal time where people are like, okay, this isn't going away anytime soon. We've got to just get back on track and keep the businesses going. And, um, and again, resetting goals. People are looking right now. It's mid-year. Let's, let's look at where we are now. Let's look at where we're going to get to the end of the year um, and into next year, knowing that this change is more permanent than we thought it was going to be. And what are we going to do? What are going to be the new goals? What, what's reasonable? Um, understanding from our customers what our customers want, you know, that's really important too. And and so all of those things play in um, into that in terms of you know, really holding people accountable. Briefly before, before we pause you for a minute, one of the most interesting things you said to me last week when we were talking about this conversation today was this notion that yes, LinkedIn learning is important. Yes, adapting your skills is important, but reading about your industry it's probably the key skill in your mind, yes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, staying relevant is so, so important. It's always, it always has been in terms of getting ahead in your career, um, but I think now more than ever, especially in the digital world and the retail world, every day uh, there is some, uh, something changing. Every day there's something innovative uh, in front of us. We have to know about those things. And in order to really make a contribution to your organization and show value, you've got to be the one that comes to the table with those ideas and say, you know, I just read this article last night. You know, did you hear about this? And be excited, show energy, and really show your passion and commitment to the prof profession that you're in, uh, whether it's just, you know, re retail brick and mortar, retail digital, um, you know, e commerce, whatever, uh, whatever field you're in and, and even expand your horizons, you know, connect the dots, think, think more broadly, think out of the box. I, I just had that conversation with somebody, one of my managers today, we were talking about, you know, Hey, we just, you know, we got to think out of the box. And they were like, yeah, you know, you're right. We do. And, and you know, and you get people energized and uh, bringing that to the table, staying relevant, Bringing those ideas to the table is going to show your value and you, you will make a contribution and continue to get ahead. Excellent place to pause and then we'll come back to you again when we have Q&A in a few minutes. So please be sure you're submitting your questions as we go through this. Uh, I do want to invite Karis Jones to join us. Karis is the Director of Human Resources for Good American and Skims. Our current focus is on recruiting top talent and creating equity in the workplace by creating programs, partnerships that focusing on increasing access for black and brown people in the fashion apparel business. Um, I read that straight off your bio because I'd like to start right there. This seems like the best moment to address the need for more diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I, I was hoping you could start by setting the stage for us. What have you seen and what do you see moving forward? Yeah, um, thank you for having me first. Um, so I think that, you know, over the past 10, 15 years, we have seen a huge push for representation, right? We're seeing um, a more diverse, um, a more diverse person in our marketing. We're having, um, you know, our models are more diverse and especially in the fashion industry, we've seen a, a huge push for that. And I think that you know, it's been kind of slow to show up in the boardroom, right? So um, really what companies are talking, at least I, I can't see them not talking about it right now, but what companies are talking about right now 
or you know how to make a bigger bigger social impact altogether and investing more and prioritizing around um, social initiatives and that's going to include for sure di diversity and having a more diverse culture in our workplace and so i think that um, you know in the past we looked at the employee we're advertising for kind of this straight white man that's kind of the the ultimate employee that's who we kind of pictured that we are advertising our 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 company and 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 our roles to and we have seen such a huge shift in what an employee is what that what employees want and what they're looking for from um, a company or for a job for a job and so we are having to shift how we advertise our business to those um, to those candidates. And so I think the first thing is in hiring, we're gonna have to look at different um, resources. So for instance, us at Good American and Scams, we typically use um, LinkedIn. And I think most companies are, are using that as a resource, you know, that's got a huge amount of people on there, all different cultures all over the world, which is wonderful. But I think we may have to be, um, might have to source with more intent and start looking at job boards that, you know, focus specifically on diversity, uh, diversity.com for one, or also looking into job boards that, um, that work with moms specifically. There's, there's all types of resources that we can tap into to allow access for other um, people. But is it really that easy? So, so an executive comes to you and says, I need you to hire this person, this is my friend's daughter, or et cetera. How do you accomplish the diversity when oftentimes the, the hierarchy doesn't portray the diversity you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, you're right, and, and that's tough. And I think that that is, um, always an issue even when you're not necessarily talking about race or diversity is it's kind of a nepotism right you know like oh i've got this person here they're great and and sometimes they are great you know but um other times we're not you know focusing on on other people which can lead to having a whole bunch of people in your office that look just like you or just like the boss or just like whoever and we really need to be careful about that because um when that happens um you know, the focus of the company, the message, the customer all gets very narrowed. And so I think it, you have to put policies, systems in place that try to keep you on the right track. So, you know, you want to have, um, when, you, when you open up a role, you want to get together an interview team, you want to get together a team that's going to be uh, making decisions in this hiring. And so you want to have more than one person just saying, hey, you know, I know this. I know this person, let's just bring them on in. You know, we want to say, hey, every time let's get at least five to 10 solid candidates. Let's make sure that we have different backgrounds, um, have a diverse range of people that we can speak to. Um, also, some things we might want to do is during the interview process, you, we have been adding on now a diversity and, and inclusion team member onto those interview panels to make sure that those questions um, get answered and you don't you know and, and it's touchy talking about race even as i'm speaking to you to you guys about it now it's you know a little bit awkward and oh how far is she going to go but i think that um you know one thing that another thing that companies can do internally is just start to have these conversations make it easier around each other and then i think it gets uh you, you figure out better ways to um make your goals happen around diversity and inclusion and get more buy-in from the rest of your employees as well. Yeah, those are some interesting um, points. And I, th I think, you know, anybody could take a lot from, from what you've just said. It's, it's interesting too. So I, I think about a recurring theme we've seen in this series as we look toward this future of the design of business and it's brand as thought leader. Um, you think about Nike with Colin Kaepernick, Patagonia and its commitment to outdoors. I even think about Skims, I mean, not to compliment you, but your own company and its commitment to size inclusivity and diversity of color. Uh, is it then incumbent on the job seeker to find the company that aligns with her values or, or should they go and try and like disrupt, disrupt within a different space? What, what are you seeing? Yeah, so I think there's kind of maybe two parts to that answer. Um, the first part I think is just like our friend Donna was saying, 
you know, when you're working from home and you're looking for a job, you want to do something that you have some passion about it, right? That you, um, that you're, you want to be proud to work for whatever business and represent them and, and, and say, hey, you know, I represent this company because they stand for a lot of things that I believe in, or at least they are on board with those things and, and are happy to, um, you know, let me forge my way that with, with those social justice issues. So I think it's important to do a lot of research, research the brand, figure out, um, you know, if their values align with, with yours. I don't think that we should um, go into a business and say, oh, you know, let me knock everything over, you know, this needs to be done, we need to be doing this now, if not, you know, you're bad. You know, I think all, I think all businesses and just, um, you know, America in general is, is on a journey. Some people are coming along a little bit slower. Some people are moving a little bit faster and we've got to have compassion for one another. Um, and we have to be able to, to work with people that don't necessarily have our specific ideals or think just like us, you know? I think it's mm -hmm. important to be able to share those ideas and, 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 and I think it'll make your business better. I think that progressive leadership is looking at diversity and saying, hey, if I make this investment here and build these long-term relationships, it's going to make my company stronger. It's going to um, make me more authentic with my customers. They're gonna say, hey, this company understands, they get it. So uh, I think it, it, it's two parts. You know, you have to research, you have to go in there and say, you know, does, do you have a, ask those questions. You, those are great interview questions, honestly. And as a, a human resources uh, director, when someone asks me a question that's like, hey, do you, what, what, do you have a diversity and inclusion program? What type of social impact programs do you guys have? Are you doing anything around climate change? Are you doing anything around diversity? I'm like, wow, you know, that's, I'm impressed by that, that they want to know. Um, so I think that's important, but I definitely think it's important to do your research, read, understand who you're working for, what their goal is, what's the mission statement, um, what are their values, and then you'll be able to easily, more to more easily align with a company that you can be proud of to work for. Related to that, this I think is an interesting question, is, is the, your own social media presence. I am the applier. Um, so many of us have been politically active recently, but even before that, around, you know, that's, there's a pretty active political culture in our country right now. Um, the company, let's say, it completely aligns with my thoughts. Do I need to edit, curate the content that I'm posting to my own channels in the job market? I would say yes. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think there, you need to have integrity and, um, you know, if, if, and stand for what you believe in. But at the same time, if you're a current job seeker um, and, you, and you don't, you know, in the moment have job security, then I think you need to um, be able to, to represent what's important to you, but do that in a way that is, um, you know, not real aggressive. And those are just some things that when I'm looking at candidates and I go onto their social media page, um, it, it makes a difference. You know, I, I would be, um, I would be very, I don't even want to say conservative because that's not true. Because if you looked at my social media page right now, you'd probably <laughs> be like, who is this girl? But uh, I think you definitely need to be thoughtful. That's the best word, be thoughtful and be mindful. And, uh, and be thoughtful and mindful, again, because like I said, everyone is on their own journey. And so you want to be able to, um, you know, to, to say, to represent things that are important to you but not in a way that dismisses other people or that, um, you know, it puts other people down is how I would say that. You and I are both native Angelinos. Um, we're also around the same age we discovered the other day. Um, we both lived through the, the 92 riots. I remember people then being very hopeful about change that maybe never really came. Um, about more diversity in workplaces, specifically the topic of our conversation again. So here we are today, Back to where we started our conversation. Fashion is a small industry. There's not a lot of diversity in it as it stands right now. Do you see this time period being different? Yeah, I think so. 
You know, I, I think so. I think it, it's all a progression. I think every little bit counts, but I do think this is a little bit different. Um, mostly because I think companies are going to be held to a different account this time. You know, you have the social media, everything's the information is a lot more transparent. And I think um, companies are not going to be able to hide behind, um, you know, uh, just a charter or policies or just a, we're an equal opportunity employer. I think that um, they're going to have to say, what, what, are, what are we doing? What are we doing now? Can we do more? Um, what does more look like? Um, I, 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 I genuinely think that social responsibility is going to be at the forefront of every um, progressive leader in, in, in across all industries, you know, and, and that can show up differently in different places. But I think that the public is going to hold uh, businesses more accountable than ever, especially, you know, for businesses like Good American and Skims that our brand is built on diversity. It's built around um, serving a very diverse client and, and if that's different shades, different sizes, different um, models. And so we can't use that to sell our product and then not walk the walk, right? Internally, in our community, um, community investment and outreach are going to have to be huge. And we want to take that on. We want to be at the forefront of um, those initiatives and those programs. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that the public is going to hold business and, and corporations more accountable than they have in the past. So I think it's, I definitely think we're going to see a difference this time. Thank you for, for all these insights. I want to invite Maggie and Donna to, to come join us one more time. We did get several interesting questions. Um, and I, I think start, Karis, while they turn their cameras on, I'll, I'll ask you this first one. A, a high school student with no previous experience, what's your recommendation for that person? Yeah, intern, 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 <laughs> mentor. Um, you know, it, the the rough thing about having such a high unemployment, you know, right now and, and such a large pool of candidates is you have to be able to um, separate yourself to to give yourself these experiences that'll um, that will um, help you to get to the next level and you're gonna have to create that on your own almost you know because there is such a large pool of people and a lot of graduates and a lot of people with with degrees and so I think the best thing that you can do as a, a high school student is just get into as many um, internships and just have as many experiences as you can. Um, Donna, let me direct this one at you because it is something that you actually brought up. You had recommended two pieces of software to, to improve your interviewing skills. Somebody asked if you could repeat the names of those two pieces of software. Sure. Uh, it's a uh, Hire View and it's V U E, Hire View, one word, and Interview Stream. Those are a couple. And depending if you're, if you, um, you know, uh, are in college, uh, a lot of the career development centers on the college campuses, I'm not sure whether uh, FITM has it at, um, at their career center, they actually have these softwares that you can actually practice. So definitely go on to your, your university's website for their career center and see if they offer that to you, as well as alumni, usually they offer that as well. Um, Maggie, interesting question here. Uh, where is a good place to start when aiming to work for your dream company? The example this person gave is Nike. So if you wanted to work for Nike, what do you do to end up there? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. Look, you know, I think the most important thing is to create and identify a target list. And it's great to have a company like Nike that is aspirational and um, that we go after and, and, and then have, you know, uh, sort of a cohort of different companies in that space that you can pursue, um, just so we're not putting all our eggs in one basket, right? But I think the steps to take to get there are, one, I think you, you have to research that company through and through, and you may know them as a consumer in terms of the brand, but research the company, their culture, we talked about values see where there is alignment in your values so that you can really play that up uh, in your resume, on your LinkedIn profile, and, uh, and then ultimately, you know, hopefully in an interview. Um, you know, another thing I would do is definitely 
don't be afraid to, to reach out to folks, whether you know people who work there and you're just connected on LinkedIn or you don't know someone who works there. And I think the best place to start is hit the recruiting team, whether that's uh, an HR representative, if it's a smaller organization and they don't necessarily have a dedicated talent acquisition recruiting team. Um, but if they do have recruiters, talent acquisition specialists, go to them and express your interest, but express it with real deliberate intent. Why Nike? And know, know what that is for you. Know what it is about Nike that is that that makes it so aspirational so that you can do that outreach. I would just add to that that um, I, I did a LinkedIn workshop for our, our interns that we're hosting virtually this summer. And one of the questions that came up was specifically around this, you know, is it appropriate to reach out to people you don't know on LinkedIn? And if so, how far do you go in that outreach? Um, I, I said, I would, I would stop with asking questions. So I would do the outreach, let them know why you're reaching out, whether there's a specific job and or you're interested in Nike. But I think if you go as far as to then, you know, start using that initial connect request to make it a larger conversation and, you know, ask a bunch of questions, you might lose them. So I would start by something really succinct that will grab their attention and let them know that you're interested and why. And then once they make that accept to connect, then take it a step further and, and follow up and see if you can kind of get in front of them. I think that's really valuable. And then beyond that, most companies these days, especially in the environment that we're in now, are, are hosting different events, recruiting events. Um, whether you're a, a college student uh, or you know, will be a college student or you're you know, in your, into your career, look for hiring events that Nike's hosting and they're a global business. So they'll be doing those everywhere. Um, and, and really try to seek those out so that you can attend similar things to what we're doing today with Nike. Uh, I'm always blown away when we hope, you know, host hiring events when, when candidates later reference it. And I have candidates even two years later who are like, Oh, is that your girls in tech event? It was amazing. And, and, and it stands out to me because it tells me that they, you know, they are really um, interested in our company and our brand and there's something that they saw that spoke to them. So those are just a few. I could probably uh, go on and on on this. So I'll, I'll stop myself there, but just a few, a few tips on that one. I saw a lot of nodding. I have to add on that actually. Yeah, um, one of the things that I always, again, depending on where you are in your, uh, in your journey uh, and from an education standpoint toward graduation, um, I constantly used to tell students um, when, uh, is go work at the retail store, find the Nike retail store, get in there, get to know the product. You know, that if you are, if that's your dream company, then go do it. And, and honestly, if you want to get into the fashion industry, the retail industry, you, going in early on, starting even in high school, I saw I, there was a question, I believe, from a, a high school student that was posted. Um, you know, get that retail experience. You can start when you're 16, uh, working in a store. You can, you could, I can't even tell you how many, how many students I hired uh, into my buying programs that were assistant managers at, at stores. So they had worked their way up through uh, high school and, and college and um, boom, they, they were right. They were very marketable um, when graduation time came. Um, Karis, interesting one, but I'll start with you and then maybe see if anybody else wants to add on. Skims being more of a startup culture, that's why I'm going to direct this one at you to begin with. This person says that she's a recent business uh, management bachelor's graduate, starting her own e-commerce business, wondering if I wanted to enter the workforce in a more traditional role at a later time, would HR managers view starting my own business as an asset or would you recommend gaining experience at existing established companies more valuable? I think now with this um, gig economy and, and totally with the future of work, <laughs> basically, um, I think it's okay to have been an entrepreneur, to have started your own business. I think it shows a lot of, um, you know, tenacity and determination just to go off and do that on your own anyway. So I think that's great. I think what you have to do is to be able to um, take that experience in and just talk about how that would work in a corporate environment or in a, you know, a, a regular 
traditional business environment. I think that, um, you know, as an entrepreneur or in starting your own business, you're going to come in with a lot of leadership skills and you want to speak to that when you're interviewing and, and when you're dealing with um, recruiters and, and just talk about how those skills transfer into their business and, and how they could make it, how that person would be able to make an impact on their business with what they've learned as an entrepreneur. So I think um, we'll be seeing more candidates who are coming from um, having their own company or, or working freelance or independent contractors and working maybe short stints in different businesses or uh, in their own business. So I, I, I think we'll see that more traditionally and, and, and be able to see how that, just speak to how that transfers over. Donna, you guys are a more traditional company. You've been around for a while. Any, any thoughts to add on to that or any different perspective? I would tend to ag agree with what Karis is saying. I think, you know, uh, mindsets have changed. Um, you know, they value that, that entrepreneurial spirit. And again, it's really how you communicate, how you're going to transfer those skills over and what, you know, having a good, a good explanation as to, you know, why do you want to make this transition to the corporate world? It's, it definitely is a transition. And, uh, but again, I think that especially in the creative side of the business, um, digital, creative, um, they're, most companies today, they want those creative juices. So I, I really think that in that world, especially, um, they're going to welcome that, uh, that entrepreneurial and spirit and that you were, you know, started something that maybe, you know, was very successful. So. Um, just a limited amount of time left. So I, I want to do one question that maybe all three of you can hit on um, and maybe just try and keep your answers to 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Um, this person submits the question and says, I'm a jack of all trades in arts and design and master of none. And it sort of builds off what you just asked, Donna, or just said. Uh, I'm having a tough time narrowing down where to apply and how. Maybe this resonates with me because I think this was me 20 years ago. Uh, any tips for this artist type person you know, which is really when you think about what FIDM is generating when we're sending these people out into the world, this is who we've created. And I think oftentimes we struggle then with well, where do I fit? I love so much, uh, I got to go into a box somehow. So Maggie, maybe we'll start with you. Any tips for an artist type on entering the workforce? Sure. You know, I think when I talk to talent like this, and I've certainly come across many in, in my line of work over the years, I think it's about identifying one, what are your top priorities? What are you most passionate about, right? You know, Donna spoke to that earlier, being passionate about your work and, and that will show through in any interview that you do. So know what those are. Um, and, and then from there, we could take those and say, okay, these are the three things within arts and design that you're really particularly good at. Um, let's, let's explore whether that's going into a, a creative director or a, you know, art direction type role, digital graphic designer. Do you love doing design digitally? Or are you more of a, a hand-drawn artist? And maybe um, do you love, you know, all things fashion and you want to push into the world of, of actually being an apparel designer? Um, there's so many different facets in the business now when it comes to, to arts and creative and, and the world of design. So I think it's just, it's, it's really about identifying your priorities, your passions, and then exploring different jobs that you see um, actually encapsulate some of those some of those desires and passions, um, and then sort of weeding weeding out the ones that that may not speak to you. Uh, I think that'll help give you some focus. Karis, anything to add on to that in terms of how what does an artist do? Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> what does an artist do? Um, <laughs> I, I really think that, um, you know, the freelance and the contracting is really becoming a much wider avenue for artists and for creative people. You know, often in our business, we um, outsource for particular collections or for um, particular uh, programs that we want to run. Um, and so we look for uh, someone who can do just a temporary stint or someone who can come in for six months or, or a year and accomplish a goal that we have and, and get that done. And, and so I think there, there's, there's definitely room. Also, um, as teams run way more lean than I think they have in the past, um, for instance, at Good American and Skims, we run very lean teams. And so often we look for people that can work cross-functionally or who can 
do one role, but maybe wear a hat some other way that can lead, um, maybe that can lead some freelancer or, or contract employees. So I think there is um, room for people who have different interests or multiple interests, but um, like Maggie was saying, I do think it's important to kind of find one or two things that you can narrow down and become really good at that so that um, when you're on a team, you can add, you know, huge value to that area. So, so Don, I'm hearing narrow down if you can. I'm hearing the gig work is a good place to go. Anything to add on top of that? Yeah, one of the things I think it's also that you can explore to try to figure out, you know, what do you really want to do? You can do some volunteer work, you know, look for opportunities to volunteer and, um, and you know, build, build skills that way and start to explore the things that uh, you find out that you like, the things that you find out that you really don't like. Um, but remember that you're, you know, it's a journey. So I, I, one thing that I always used to remember, you know, students would be like, oh my God, you know, wh when, how am I going to find the job? You know, it, it's got to, and they think it has to be perfect. Don't go into it thinking that it has to be perfect. We can probably all speak to, you know, no job is ever perfect, right? So it's all about what, you know, the journey that you, that you put yourself on. And as long as you're open, Maggie alluded to this way in the beginning, as long as you go into everything with an open mindset and a mindset that you want to continue to learn and grow, um, you are going to, you're, you're going you're gonna to find your way. Um, so so go, just go, maybe there's one thing about the job or two things about the job that you look for that uh, hits the mark in terms of things that you know you enjoy, go for it. And then things will, things will work out and you'll, you'll make your journey, you'll grow those skills and you'll continue to develop. And the next thing you know, you're, you, you're in the job of your dreams. We all hope, right? I, I appreciate you all so much. Karis, Donna, Maggie, thank you for joining us today.